Guys, how's the form? Thanks so much for joining us. Episode three of the Ditches podcast with Red Wolf Media here from Belfast. I'm joined by the two other senior hurlers, Roman Shorthall on my right and Polly Doyle on my left. Got a great show this afternoon. We're going to be joined by former Garda Commissioner Martin Callan for an exclusive interview. Stay with us for that. We're going to talk a little bit about Simon Harris. We're going to talk a little bit about the Attorney General's advice to government on an amendment to its planning bill. And we're going to talk a little bit about the guards, the gourds, the gourds, as, as, uh, as some denizens of South Dublin would say. We'll kick off with Simon Harris, a uh, man who gave a rising speech to his party this week, uh, new leader of Fine Gael. He's taking our flag back. He is taking our flag back. He, there's been a lot of chatter about what it means for Fine Gael, what Simon Harris is, how he views his party. He talks about it being a, a Christian democratic party. And in all this chatter about Fine Gael values, what do you think the party's values are? And do you think Simon Harris embraced those values when he opposed a homeless shelter in Wicklow when he was a young TD? Yeah, well, I mean, he wasn't very Christian, was he? When, you know, he was trying to to link, um, you know, society's most vulnerable people to crime in order to uh, block a homeless shelter in his constituency in Wicklow Town. He helped contribute to about a seven month delay to a homeless shelter yeah. in Wicklow Town. Yeah, he did on the basis that he was worried um, about tidy towns and stuff like that, you know. Yeah, yeah, the worry about about the town's tidy towns rating was uh, was a nice little touch. That is Fine Gael values, actually, for me. Yeah, I mean, yeah, all of the stuff like that he raised was very much the type of stuff that would go down well in in his constituency or in his particularly, you know, around where he lives in Greystones. Um, I think you know, for a lot of people, like that's the kind of the you know, not to kind of. Um, tarnish everyone with the same brush but like you know it's ah, tarnish everyone with the same brush. <laughs> oh, <laughs> why not like, like, it's it's no yeah. one's gonna stop it <laughs> the sort of stuff like that he raised like about crime and um you know uh, tidy towns and it being across from wicklow jail and you know fucking yankee tourists getting off the bus and you know what what would they think like if they saw a homeless uh, shelter you know that's the sort of stuff, like, um, you know, that, uh, as I said, like, would go down well, like, in, uh, in certain parts. Yeah. For, uh, for a flavour of the international coverage reacting to his election, without an actual election <laughs> as such, um, as leader of Fine Gael, Politico, they called him, in their headline, they called him the fir uh, uh, Ireland's first TikTok prime minister. Not to get up on the high horse about, like, I don't really give a fuck about, you know, international publications not using Taoiseach, but it was in, like, TikTok Taoiseach was right there, but they, uh, but they didn't go for it. A lot of the chat, like, in the political piece, they talked a lot about how he's an amazing communicator. <laughs> and you see this in Irish press as well. Oh, he's an incredible communicator. He does have, yeah, he has more followers on TikTok than He's his, amazing at communicating like, information from cabinet to journalists. <laughs> he is very, very good at that. He's though. a very, very effective communicator. But he, yeah, when he was addressing the party, the clip that's been doing the rounds is um, when he he talks about he, he he talks about taking our flag back. Now this is to go from the story we published about his opposition to a homeless shelter. That was in his early days as a TD. Then it was only a few years later when he became in certain quarters he became most associated with the movement to repeal the eighth there was there was some real insufferable shite around that time actually of he, he became a little bit of a woke bay for a while like a lot of people kind of held their noses and embraced him and now he's but now it's kind of he performed very well in a debate as i recall against was it patter tobin actually okay. and the two of them debated and everyone then online was like simon harris is my boyfriend <laughs> <laughs> because he had one good debate but he but here he is now, right? And, and, and he's talking about taking our flag back, having, having respect for the guards, the gourds. When he says 
take our flag back. What do you think he means? Like, what does the flag mean to him? What kind of country does he does he want it to fly for? He wants a country that's not governed by Sinn Féin and therefore the kind of shadowy IRA Army Council. Who Say what you like about him, <laughs> but you cannot deny he does not like Sinn Féin. He likes Sinn Féin. He doesn't like Sinn Féin almost as much as he say, doesn't like homeless people. <laughs> yeah. You know, he did that as well. Was it during the motion of confidence in Varadkar around the, in the aftermath of the story about him leaking the document to Matthew O'Toole. I remember Harris got up and he was he was criticizing Mary Lou MacDonald and he said something he he invoked how the US electorate had rejected Trumpian politics. Don't you dare bring those politics into <laughs> into our country here. Yeah, it's like yeah, he's trying to do that with the talk of like taking the flag back and kind of like pretending um, that he's, I don't know. Or he's trying to do that with uh, all the talk about taking the flag back and trying to act because... like a right wing populist, like he's a tough guy. But it, that's not very convincing when last week you were doing TikToks where you were like, and best of luck to everyone with their junior cert results. Like, it's just <laughs> not very convincing <laughs> that now he's some sort of a right wing strongman who's trying to like, you know, drag Ireland back to family values, respecting farm farmers, respecting the guards, I don't know, fucking lower wages, whatever it is, Fina Kale also uh, want. Because he also, obviously, that talk about, take our flag back, take it back, take it back. It was the way he repeated it so often, like, it was like, oh, I'm, I'm on to something there, you know. Obviously, this oh, was... Oh, you like that. <laughs> yeah, this was in, in reference to the funeral of Pierce Macaulay, had a tricolour, draped over it, um, over his coffin, which, like, I, I could be wrong on this, but, like, is it not right to say that any fucking Egypt can have a tricolour draped on their coffin? Like, I mean, what are we going to do? We're going to say no more no more tricolours for for anyone. Obviously, like, you had Owen O'Brien and Pierce Doherty both, both came out and said, oh, well, he wasn't a Republican. Republicans don't respect him, which is also just isn't enough for people either. You can see people... People are kind of quibbling with O'Brien and and Doherty's denunciations, but obviously it was good fodder for Simon Harris addressing Fine Gael because he is he's a big fan of the guards as well, of course. Simon Harris, he's made that you know part of his brand. But this thing of take our flag back, take our flag back, where I'm just like you know to invoke uh, John Hume, you can't eat a flag. You know, I, I'm not really sure, and, and 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 the fact that Harris is talking about this in a southern context as well. Even to be honest, I would say you have Irish liberals get very worked up about whatever you want to call them, right, far right, fash or nationalist circles. Their usage of the flag, and we have to take it back from them. Take it back from them, which. I'm just like, can we not just, uh, can we not make things, can we not make things materially better for people? But all of this, like, you know, it's, it is quite hard, I suppose, to, it's quite hard to tell what Simon Harris's values are and what he actually stands for, to be honest. It's also hard to kind of, to try to figure out how will he be materially different to Varadkar in his leadership of Fine Gael and the country. Do you have any take on what he like what he it will what his leadership will actually mean for people beyond some bullshit speeches? <laughs> More flags, I think. More flags. Flags for everyone, miniature yeah. flags for everyone. Well, I mean he said as well that he's just gonna steady the ship, right? He wants to implement the plan for government. So his stated aims are just kind of like we're just gonna keep doing what we're doing, but more Fina Gale <laughs> and with flags, you know. Some of the opinion polling, this is this is a little bit Paul Corey for my taste, but some of the opinion polling has suggested that Harris is, he's popular with Fine Gael membership. This was after the fact of his election. There were kind of murmurings that he was popular with the parliamentary party, but less so with the the broader party itself. All of the opinion polling since suggests that Fine Gael chose the wrong man, second time, <laughs> second time in a row. Do you think he's the right man for Fine Gael or have they fucked themselves again? 
I, I just, like, I don't really see <clears throat> how someone like Simon Harris would appeal, like, to, you know, Fine Gael's rural base. I just, I don't see it, like, I mean, I think, you know, I know, I know he didn't, he didn't want it, but I, I would have thought, like, Simon Coveney, um, you know, would have appealed more, like, to a rural base, or even Heather Humphreys. Um, but <laughs> fan of the ditch. Big fan of the ditch, yeah. But yeah, it's kind of like you know, uh, yeah. It 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 just it it's it's hard to see. Like, it's almost like I I don't understand how he became leader. Like, it's it's just it seems all it just seems a bit mad. Like, I don't really see how um, it's going to benefit the party in any way. I just think he comes across like as a fake person. Like I think it's all an act. What do you think the significance of his career trajectory is? Well, like he, you know, he um, basically his entire career has been politics. I mean, I don't, as far as I know. Some people like that, you know, I mean, like, you know, like it's interesting, different people's interpretation of the word technocracy where there are people who are like, oh, we need more technocrats. We need professional politicians. Obviously, to others, myself included, I think it's a bad thing. I would have thought it's a bad thing. I mean, you know, you grow up in, uh, you know, in Greystones, which is, you know, he, he, he grew up like in a, in a very wealthy part of the country. Now, you know, he'll say like his parents were, you know, from a working class background. That's fine. But like, he's not. You know, everyone like I always find it gas when people try to invoke their parents' background. It's always middle class people who do it, like where they'll go like, "Oh well, my parents were this." And it's like, "All right, okay, what about you?" Yeah, it's um, yeah, it's quite common. Like, um, uh, you know, I, I think it's it's bullshit. Like, I mean, he grew up uh, in a you know comfortable middle class background in Greystones, and you know went straight into politics, like. That's that's his career, like that's what he's done, and you know it's unsurprising then that he uh, is objecting to homeless shelters. Do you know what I mean? Like because I'm not saying you have to be homeless to be Taoiseach, but you know he's he's clearly never had to kind of really engage with any of these uh, social issues like that 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 affect a lot of people in the country. And um, yeah, I think he's just going to be uh, as out of touch, if not more out of touch than Leo Varadkar. Going to your head and related to that, if you could put a percentage on it, that story we did about Harris's ob uh, objection to a homeless shelter, what percentage of uh, Fine Gael members and supporters would be, would think that was a great thing versus the percentage you might have Buyer's remorse over Harris's ascension. Um, it's it's hard to tell. I don't know. I'd say over half, probably. That's probably me being. Too, who would like it? Who would like it? Yeah. I would say. It's like, hi, yes. <laughs> yeah. well, what about We're the back, what, about the what about the tidy towns? <laughs> yeah. You know. Um, but it's a very Fine Gael thing, though, about you know what will how what will tourists think of visible poverty? I can talk the day before St. Patrick's Day as well. We were talking about it, about it a bit last week, picking all these people up and dumping them outside of the city. You know, it's the same, it's the same thing. So that's a, a core Fine Gael value. You know, it's making sure that homeless people are hidden away out of sight. So I'd imagine most of them would like it. But there is, I mean, there's, there's a French writer and sociologist called Edouard Louis, who he wrote a trilogy of books Auto fiction, I suppose, which you invented, actually, I believe. Uh, auto fiction books about his upbringing in France. He actually did have a working class background and and upbringing. And in the third book of the trilogy, mm -hmm. "Who Killed My Father," he describes this. It, there had been some announcement by the French government that certain family. It, it was kind of like a like a one-off government payment, like a like a kind of like a social welfare payment. And he he recounts when this was announced and the absolute euphoria that it inspired in his household because it meant so much to them. And they went out to pack the car up and they went off for a trip to the beach. 
and they had this amazing day like and it was um it was all good stuff for them but louis goes on to talk about how he talks about the significance and the importance of this one-off payment to them and then he and then he goes on to talk about the people who the people who talk about politics who write about politics the people who the people for whom their political identity is a very important part of their being by and large these people in Lu in louise words are people who, for whom the state has never broken their backs the state has never fucked with their digestion like you know uh, but yet they embrace it it's 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 it just as a form of aesthetics really it's never life or death to them and what i want to know is bearing that in mind do you do you know anyone off the top of your head who like people our age who who do embrace a, an identity based around fine Gael? all the opinion polling says that they're very much in the minority i always find it interesting when you when you meet people our age well simon harris i guess right? simon <laughs> harris. it's so like to borrow a phrase from danny dyer it does freak my nut out that i'm older than him i think i'm older than him he's 37 Oh, is, is he 37? All oh, right. Well, he's a little bit older than me. Yeah, like I've met some people like that, and they would kind of self-identify as they're kind of young fogies, and they would self-identify as a politics nerd, and they're completely politics junkie, certainly. politics nerd, politics <laughs> yeah. junkie, and they're completely detached from material politics, and it's all about, as you said, aesthetics. It's all about the kind of theatre of the whole thing, and the fixation is on. You know, they'd, they'd spend their days watching, say, old Ronald Reagan speeches or something like that, or reading, they'd read Barack Obama's autobiography. And you can tell that, like, Simon Harris was one of these people and he even has all these kind of mannerisms that have been learned clearly from kind of watching other politicians abroad or on YouTube. Um, and he did that again last week with that speech. He was clearly echoing other leaders that he's seen online from around the world and trying to just kind of, like you know, I don't know, perform. Does anyone buy, like, he fancies himself, like, to go into the, to the aesthetics of it, like, he sees himself as, as a strong man. <laughs> like, he really does. <laughs> like, does anyone buy him as a strong man? Maybe Fina Gaia remembers. I don't know. I mean, like, I think, as Roman said, like, he's not going to be that appealing to some of the, the kind of rural base of Fina Gael, which probably explains why he's overcompensating, trying to appear like a big... Strong guy. Strong man. <laughs> <laughs> you know, he's going to do a few pull-ups next time he's had a... <laughs> yeah. uh, of course, I mean, he was a major contributing factor to the collapse of the last government, where rather than send him out to face a second vote of confidence, <laughs> the government said, no, like, let's, just, let's, just, uh, let's just cut this government here. I mean, if we all abstained on a vote of confidence in him, but now they're going to, they, they abstain on, there was a vote of confidence in him over his handling of the, uh, the National Children's Hospital. And uh, Fianna Fáil, rather than vote confidence in him, they actually ab abstained on him. But now they're going to vote him in as, in as Taoiseach. Do you think anyone in Fianna Fáil, like, have, have their minds actually been changed? Or is this just something that they feel they have to do? Yeah, I think everyone's just going to go along with it, aren't they? The Greens as well. Like I don't think, um, don't think there's going to be any last-minute surprises. Um, wouldn't make sense either because you know a lot of these people in uh, in Fianna Fáil are looking at losing seats. So you're you're, you're playing politics by pointing this at the rest as well. <laughs> of course, actually, on the strongman stuff as well. I'll tell you one time when Simon Harris was strong when he and you know it's ironic that you know he he, he faced uh he faced a vote of confidence over his handling of the construction of the new national children's hospital which you know the costs just keep adding up and adding up adding up adding up and they and they continue to add up with seemingly little little kind of done about it as far as these rising costs go of course he did he did threaten striking nurses with a financial penalty like he was like no these uppity nurses aren't getting any more money he was a strong guy then actually in fairness to him um yeah i mean it's it's kind of like 
what is a strong guy? Like, what what is he trying to kind of prove to people? Like, you know, with all this kind of shy talk about flags and, you know, it's like he's tried it before, like, as you said, like he's tried it with, uh, with the nurses and, you know, it just, it it's kind of cringeworthy, like to watch him kind trying of. to be a, <laughs> a strong man. Like, it's just, it's not really believable. You know, he's already kind of, um, you know, comes across like as a very, uh, well, like a lot of, you know, most politicians are kind of acting, you know, but like his acting is like, you know, Z list acting. Like it's just, it's not believable. Like when you see him, like, you ain't seen nothing yet. Though. Through, yeah, <laughs> you ain't seen nothing yet. <laughs> <laughs> A matter of actual material importance to people, housing, of course. Uh, talk us through this week, we published a story about the Attorney General's advice to government on an amendment to its planning bill. Yeah, so, yeah, very interesting story. Um, we had this amendment introduced by Daryl O'Brien last month. Um, uh, to the, the 2023 Planning and Development Bill. And <clears throat> at the time, uh, I think it was Owen O'Brien and Keen O'Callaghan uh, at the Joint Oireachtas Housing Committee were asking questions about this amendment because basically what it meant is that if a particular county or area had reached their, uh, you know, targets in terms of uh, housing permissions that uh, in in that scenario they wouldn't be able to refuse planning permission on that basis uh, nor would uh, on board Planola and yeah there were questions about it at the time but uh, as revealed by ourselves uh, through the Attorney General's advice um, it, it, it appears that this particular amendment was tailor-made for one developer, for one planning permission. Um, that happens to be in Greystones and Simon House. This is Carn Homes. Yeah. Um, and it's, in, in fact, like, it's so specific to this planning permission that the Attorney General, who, uh, you know, did his job and <clears throat> basically said like hang on a second like you know come on guys <laughs> like this is really fucking obvious what you're trying to do here he actually said uh, that this uh, amendment this draft amendment has like basically wicklow centric language that's language they basically copied and pasted from the wicklow development plan yeah, or its equivalent exactly and he said that because you've done this it may not apply to other uh, it's going to be like another developer in Donegal, some are going, ah, oh, fuck, we're going to have to build a house in Wicklow yeah. now instead. Like, <laughs> bad news is we don't have planning permission to build in Donegal. The good news is we get to build in Wicklow. In Wicklow now. Yeah. And like, it's, um, it's so, it's not only that, it's that the Attorney General actually says at the start of the advice that, um, uh, I'm trying to remember the exact word he used, but he said that, uh, prompted, yeah. yeah he prompted. said that this, this amendment was prompted by this refusal of 90 odd units in Greystones. So like, we also have then Darrell O'Brien's, uh, you know, closest confidant, his special advisor, Kevin Dillon. Um, Kevin Dillon, do you know whenever I see his name written and whenever we talk about him, I always like, that's the name of the actor who plays Johnny Drama in Entourage. So this is who I'm picturing in my, I'm picturing Johnny Drama advising Dar O'Brien. He looks a little bit like him. Does he? Yeah. I haven't even seen a picture of him. Yeah. Yeah, he, he, um, he could pass for drama is what you're saying. Right? Yeah, possibly. Yeah. Uh, um, but I, I enjoyed this. <laughs> <laughs> um, he, he actually uh, met with uh, a um, representative from that developer, I think a guy named James Benson, four times since that refusal. And uh, we're supposed to believe like that, 
this amendment just came from the department, or at least that's what Junior Minister Malcolm Noonan told an Oireachtas committee this morning. You asked the department where they, where they lobbied on this particular amendment, and what did they say? They sent me a book, basically, <laughs> yeah, like yeah. a fucking an essay, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, not answering the question. Yeah. But uh, there was a hilarious moment uh, at the committee today where um, I think I can't remember if it was Owen O'Brien or Keena Collin asked Malcolm Noonan about this and said, you know, what's the crack? Like, come on, like, was, were you lobbied about this yeah. or were any special advisors lobbied? And uh, Malcolm Noonan, like, you know, he had someone whispering in his ear from the department and he said, uh, no, no, there was no lobbying about this. And then uh, either uh, Keen O'Callaghan or Owen O'Brien then asked, like, what about these meetings with Kevin Dillon? You know, Johnny Drama. Johnny Drama, yeah. yeah. You know, what's the crack with these? And then uh, Malcolm Noonan says, I, I, I don't know anything about those meetings. And then Keen O'Callaghan says, like, you know, he basically says, well, like, how the fuck can you say that there was no lobbying if you don't even know about these meetings? You know, like he's saying on the one hand, nah, there was no lobbying about this amendment from developers, but then admits that he had no fucking idea that these meetings took place. So, like, how can he say that? Yeah. You know? Now, you know, obviously when we published the story, like... <laughs> I've added into it like where we could actually publish a story where we say we are going to buy everyone in Ireland a delicious pint of Guinness and there will be a cohort of people who will be like, typical, I don't even like Guinness, <laughs> like, you know, people who will have a problem with it. Obviously, there, there was a cohort of people who, you know, it's funny when, when, when you publish a story like that, that shows that, I mean, what's the best way of putting it? Did, the attorney general said that government was prompted by the refusal of planning permission in one case but you know yeah th when you publish something like that you do have you have people you know broadly speaking on the left who will have who will get worked up about you know the same old story a developer having inordinate undue influence on Irish planning law and state policy, then you'll have other people who will say, oh, well, this, this is great. This is great, yeah. great, great, Let great, the market great. decide. The market decide. So aren't Carn Homes the very people that we need to be talking to <laughs> in a housing crisis? <laughs> Polly, like, you know, if you could ventriloquize these people or maybe do a bit of acting yourself, I mean, like, what is there to be said for bring developers on board during a housing crisis? Well, we're increasing supply, which is the main thing, right? That's kind of the, that's the expression that all these guys use over and over supply again. It's just, it's just kind of like, we're increasing supply, but it's never specified like what, <laughs> what type of housing the supply is made up of. And very often it's housing that's not available to the public to buy and is rented out at an exorbitant rate and nobody has access to. But all it is to the, it's so abstract to all of these people who are saying this that they just see a number and they go, this is fucking great. <laughs> Everything is brilliant. I I'm like sure. big numbers. <laughs> and yeah. we need, yeah, and the, <laughs> we know, we, the, things have never been better for landlords as well, you know, in terms of rental yields, in terms of the market being, you know, slanted in their favour. And yet we're told over and over again that we need to make things worthwhile for them because they provide housing. But of course they provide housing in the same sense as a fucking ticket tout <laughs> provides tickets, you know? And funnily enough, we have anti-ticket touting laws um, either coming up or currently in place, but you can do that, you can you can hoard houses. <laughs> you know? Wasn't that Noel Rock actually? Yeah. Remember that photo call he did? Yeah. yeah. So it's, it's remarkable that it's immoral to buy 200 tickets to fucking Garrett Brooks or something like that to gouge people at it, but you can, you can buy 200 houses and do it, you the, know. The, the other incredible. thing as well, like about, you know, just to go back to these people that are saying like more supply, more supply. Like if you, if that's your ideology and you think that that is going to solve um, the housing crisis, like the Attorney General literally says in his advice that this amendment has kind of shit 
he doesn't literally say that, but like he's basically yeah, saying, think, yeah. you know, the, the wording in this is pretty shit because it may not apply to every county development plan. So like it, it shows a level of incompetence on Darrell O'Brien's part, because even if you think this is fucking brilliant, the Attorney General is saying that potentially this could only apply to one fucking county. We're going to have a load of houses in Wicklow. Yeah. So Skyscraper. It, it's, it's like, OK, if you, if you really think this is good, well, do you not think it should be drafted in a way that it definitely applies to every county? So yeah. every county can have <laughs> sprawling Kennedy Wilson developments. <laughs> with, with well, like the other, yeah, but the, the, the other problem actually with this particular development is like the reason it was refused is because um, like Greystones is one of the parts of the country where they've exceeded their targets in terms of building. And now there's issues with like there not being enough schools, infrastructure, things like that. So it wasn't like it was just refused for the sake of it. Like there are issues with infrastructure and, you know, various different things that, you know, you can't just say like, like, let's build a lot of houses here, but not have any services for them. Like, I mean, surely if you believe that, yeah, you know, more is better and, you know, we just need loads of houses and everything will be fine. But like, then surely you need infrastructure. For that as it's well, also, you know, like it's like it's an incantation, though. This when you come across these uh, self-proclaimed yimbies, you know, which is their inversion of NIMBY, which I don't even like as a term either. But these people who are like, yes, and yes to Kennedy Wilson, yes to, every, but no to homeless shelters, no to homeless shelters. But there are like, and I'll accept, you know, there is, there's a, there's some level of academic literature that will say like yeah there is some level of academic literature that says more supply is better for everyone like any kind of you know there are people love the you know the, the, there was one study done that suggested that luxury housing is good for the entire housing market as a whole it's the rising tide lifts all boats kind of thing now i i would say that a lot of the time when you see this academic literature, it's like, oh, right, so all housing is good housing. And then you flick through to like who wrote it. And it's like someone like called like Patsy Landlord at the International Capital Association. <laughs> you know, like there are always these, you know, links or people always tend to, they try to make out that this kind of, this kind of literature is somehow apolitical, that it just emerged in a vacuum. And they never like, seem Like to... Colm Lauder's piece. <laughs> yeah, the business yeah, post, you yeah. know, Leo Faradkar was great for housing delivery. And then, like, it doesn't say anything about <laughs> what his fucking job is. Like. <laughs> and they also yeah. just seem to think, I mean, you know, I kind of, when you hear chatter about this, oh, yeah, well, just, you know, more housing, more housing, or any kind of housing at all, doesn't matter, doesn't matter who's delivering it. It doesn't matter what these units actually are, whether they're, you know, a built to rent development or whether they're, you know, houses for sale to families, it's just, you know, more housing, more housing, more housing. I always kind of, I'm not sure if people get, well, certainly what I think is, is that, yeah, housing crisis is pretty bad in Ireland. It could get a whole lot worse. And I always think of Hong Kong, where Hong Kong is like another level above our housing crisis. And primarily, I would say, because of how Hong Kong is set up economically and that it's what's known as a heads, uh, it's what's known as a hedge city, which is a city that is considered a safe haven for international capital. So if you want to, you know, if you want to get your, you know, a solid 10% return, low risk stuff, just plow it in to property in Hong Kong and you'll get, you'll keep getting your returns. I don't think like the argument that any kind of housing will at least ameliorate the housing crisis in some way. It kind of relies on the idea that at some at some point you'll exhaust the funds that international equity, that international landlords have at their disposal, that at some point they'll go, you know what, we have enough Irish property now. Uh, have at it, like, you know. But it is this thing of, yeah, it's it's the incantation, you know. 
more hard. Like the other thing that, you know, some of these guys who are in favour of Fina Gale's approach over the last however many years have, were delighted to hear was that uh, Ryanair had bought, oh, yeah, you yeah. know, how many houses for staff members? Like, Can you uh, come across Michael O'Leary, guys? Yeah, <laughs> Michael O'Leary being your landlord is yeah. a positive development, apparently. Like, and your employer at the same time. It's a return to fucking service. And your daddy for those guys, actually. <laughs> it's That's when you get down yeah. to it, they just consider Michael Michael O'Leary daddy. Like. Their spiritual father. But it is, it is. I was going to say, it's, it's serfdom. Like, it is a return to, like, you know, you work for some guy and they're also in charge of, like, your living space. And well, aren't you bloody control. well lucky? That's the kind of attitude. Like. Uh, Ryanair being your fucking landlord. Like, that's, <laughs> like, what? Now, people who love... People who love Ryanair, people who love Michael O'Leary, and these Yimbies as well, as they call themselves. Oftentimes, another organize, organization that these guys love is Angarda Shiochana, the gourds. The and, gourds. and fetishize as well. Uh, yeah. Do you actually, before we get into it, do you know what one of my favorite videos of all time was? I think it was during COVID, and a guard showed up at a house party. <laughs> and it was somewhere in South <laughs> yeah. Dublin going on the accents like where she was the guard was remonstrating with the people throwing this house party <laughs> and off camera. You're not the police. <laughs> she's not the police. Yeah. She's not the police. <laughs> I am the fucking police. <laughs> Guys, she's not the police. It's fine. <laughs> I absolutely favorite video of all time. Uh Polly, talk us through we published a story about the courts. There was a guard in the Midlands who was subject to uh, quite harsh disciplinary procedures, um, extremely disproportionate ones over him lending a bike that was in the sitting there in the lost and found in you know the the station and lending it to an elderly man during COVID. Um, he found himself, he found his house raided, um, because apparently if you know if he well if he stole bikes he could have <laughs> he could have stole drugs right. Um, he found himself, as I said, he found himself suspended for three years. Detectives came down from Dublin to investigate the case. It was just completely disproportionate given that, you know, he'd just taken a, a bicycle. And for months and months, journalists have been covering this and speculating as to what happened here. And the way that it was covered, at least by some people, you would have been led to believe that it was kind of bureaucracy gone awry. There's too much red tape on what actually this proves is that we need a more hands-off approach to the guards and just stand back and let them do their thing because otherwise when we you know, burden them with too many rules and regulations, they end up in situations like this where a good man is you know, dragged, uh, loses uh, his ability to work uh, over something as arbitrary as a bike. Um, but what we learned la uh, earlier this week is that the, the guard who is at the center of the bike uh, controversy was identified during the course of a tribunal as having assisted a, another guard who was a whistleblower who accused uh, senior members uh, of uh, the guards of being involved in the drug trade in the Midlands. So it's, quite a, <laughs> it's quite a remarkable development. And Not only that, I mean, it, 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 it was found that there was, <clears throat> there was evidence to support his allegations about Midlands-based Gardaí being involved in the drug trade. There was, the DPP found, yes, that there certainly was evidence to support that, not the level of evidence to proceed with a criminal prosecution though, but there was very credible evidence to support those allegations. Yeah, and um, I suppose a diary entry that was included in the evidence that was written by Garda, Nikki Kyo, um, showed that um, the guard at the centre of the bike controversy had spoken to Kyo about the activities of this guard who was alleged to have been in the drug trade. He was known as Garda A throughout the course of the tribunal. And Nikki Kyo actually commented throughout the, the course of the later tribunal related to, um, he, he alleged that he'd been harassed following his disclosure, the protected disclosure. Um, he said that name really should have been redacted given the circumstances, you know. But it wasn't, and yet, but yet, the guards who were accused of involvement in the drug trade, their names were redacted throughout the entire thing. I'm going to go to Roman, who obviously you've you published an essay called "Anagarda Shiakana: A History of Violence," which a few people have uh, 
So that's oh, shocking stuff, shocking stuff. And also the kind of people who are like, you know, the ditch is far too partisan. Oh, it's so, so biased, all the rest. So I'm going to go to you on this. Um, who, who do you think Angarda Shikana serves in Ireland, down south? I think as an organisation, um, it serves the establishment, um, particularly the political establishment, and it always has. You know, I think it's, um, you know, it's arguably one of the the most uh, political police forces, I would say, in Western Europe. There's always, they also kind of want to have their cake and eat it a little bit, the guards, where when they're criticised by opposition TDs, it's supposed to be, no, you can't politicise the guards, but then, I mean, to even take a recent example, I mean, Drew Harris, Drew Harris of all people was echoing Simon Harris's sentiments about taking the flag back. Like, really? Like Drew Harris with his back? Or he's gonna, anyway, I mean, you, you would say it's, 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 it's a more political force than their equivalents elsewhere in the world. Yeah, yeah, I think so. I think it's always been like that. Um, I think, you know, establishment politicians have always protected the guards as an organization and um you know the guards have done the same you know as we've seen in the past and i mean i think that there's always been um shadowy you know we talk about like shadowy figures in the ira and everything but like there's always been shadowy figures in the guards you know it's always operated uh you know, in, in, in a very shadowy way, I would say. I'm talking about like senior management and, you know, I think this story with the bike like is another example of that. Like if Drew Harris throwing out comments like about, you know, oh, we don't know the full story, despite the fact that this guard in question has been cleared of any wrongdoing. And like, it's that sort of like shit that they throw, um, at whistleblowers and that they did he's they, a bad guy <laughs> yeah that they did with, with that they did to Morris McCabe you know like it's no coincidence that a lot of these Garda whistleblowers um you know have like serious uh you know kind of I don't know what the best way to put it is but like their lives have been destroyed because you know they did their job basically and said, look, this is what's happening. You know, uh, this is not right, be it penalty points or whatever. And they just get fucking, you know, run into the ground and destroyed. When you're talking about whistleblowers though, like when you, when you talk to them, um, it's the same story over and over again. It's like there's a playbook to get attacked fi financially. They get isolated from their colleagues. They get vilified. Um, and they're not they're no longer able to work it's like a, there's a playbook there to basically try and make them kill themselves you know and you meet people over and over again whose lives have just been completely destroyed because they try to do things by the book it's not just the guards it could be hse it could be um, the prison service it could be pick any institution and it's the same story over and over again i think the one this particular uh instance involving Nikki Kyo strikes me as a particularly vicious one, but it, it's been happening for, I mean, I don't know how long. Yeah, yeah, and I mean, we've had like a disclosure, d disclosures tribunal and, you know, been going through some of the, the, the reports. Which did find Nikki Kyo had said that he was persecuted for his whistleblowing. Now, this p disclosures tribunal didn't find in his favour, but that's what the tribunal would have said at least yeah well the, yeah the tribunal found that yeah he wasn't uh persecuted he wasn't bullied and it, although it, it didn't deal with the fact that the uh, the things that he blew the whistle on no they remain no. they no. remain credible well yeah and according to an internal garda report that we've never seen i think it was the john mooney in the sunday times reported on it it said that the the allegations were credible there was evidence of a guard involved in the heroin trade in the midlands and nothing has ever really come of that like whereas you know these guys like nicky kyo are just destroyed basically and 
been going through, like, I mean, I would go as far as saying that having looked at like a lot of the transcripts and stuff, I'd say there's an argument that the Disclosures Tribunal was a whitewash. I mean, I was looking at one uh, story, um, one particular guard, I think Paul Barry is his name, based in Cork. And the evidence of how he was treated after blowing the whistle, um, there was one story where a, a, an inspector in full uniform turned up to his GP and started asking questions about a sick note that he had. Do you know actually on that story in particular, it's a small part of it, that particular GP gave evidence to the tribunal and she, and she spoke about certainly how it was strange. I think she might have, I don't want to put words in her mouth, but I think maybe spoke in terms of uh, a level of intimidation to it, that to have this guard show up in full uniform. Small part of it, the guard maintained that he wasn't in full uniform. <laughs> I'm kind of like, hmm. Yeah, really? and I mean, yeah, yeah, really? yeah. <laughs> you know, I think I'd be more inclined to believe the the GP in this case. But like, this this uh, this guard uh, was found to have not been harassed or bullied or anything like that. He subsequently, um, or or it may have happened before, but sub subsequent to those findings, he settled his claim. The state claim, claims agency settled with this guard. In, in respect of his bullying claims. You know, like it's it's just, it's incredible that, you know, that guard, you know, he wasn't bullied. Keith Harrison wasn't bullied. Nicky Kyo wasn't bullied. But their stories are all the same. But here you have the tribunal saying, no, they weren't harassed, they weren't bullied. You know, I, I was talking to you, Polly, about one of the transcripts with Nicky Kyo giving evidence where he had put claims in, legitimate mileage claims for trips he had to take to Galway and wasn't being paid and queried it. And then they started going after him because his car was taxed as commercial instead of private and started emailing Offaly County Council and everything. Like, this is the sort of stuff, this is like textbook targeting of whistleblowers, but you have a tribunal saying, no, this, this is normal. It's incredible. Now it's time for the fans' favourite. In association this episode with Young Fine Gael, Paulie Doyle is going to give us his take of the week. Paulie, take what are you going for? Take of the week this week goes to um, the political editor of the Irish Examiner, Elaine Lachlan, who wrote that the opposition let themselves down with attacks on <laughs> Leo Faradkar in Dáil after he announced that he was to step down as Leo Varadkar in a quite mysterious What were the attacks? Fashion. Just people pointing out his obvious fucking failures constitute an attack apparently. So it was like, he failed on housing, um, his record homelessness. You can take your pick of like what people said. There's any number of failures to pick, for, pick from. But um, if you don't have anything nice to say, then why not? say nothing you know you should they, why weren't they polite and <laughs> give him his not why didn't they praise the supreme leader <laughs> it says there are times when even the politicians should put politics to one side which is that's the opening line of this piece which i think kind of says it all so yes yeah, time for our elected representatives when the leader of the country steps down suddenly mysteriously was, to just cast aside politics i was find it funny like like Michael martin speaks in those terms quite often he'll routinely accuse Sinn Féin of politicising something that is political or, you know, they're playing politics with it. Like Roland Barthes, French uh, post-structuralist philosopher, he'll talk about how the ruling class, it's a central part of their project is to depoliticise things. And, you know, according to Barthes, ruling class will do this in a really complex, sophisticated, unspoken way, but it is central to how how they how they get their ideology across and how they maintain their ideological dominance. I just always find it funny in Ireland where it's just like 
stop paying politics with it. Like, all oh, right, okay. Like, Holly Cairns wasn't nice enough. She wished <laughs> that she wished Veradkar well, but she couldn't point out a single good thing that he did. And um, we talked about this as I'm kind of shocked at just how toxic Holly Cairns is. Like, <laughs> like really, 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 but really shocked. It's amazing. I expected more from the most, the, one of the mo- like one of the mildest tweets like that you could possibly write when you know you're an opposition uh, TD and leader of a party in response to a T-shock stepping down and like people just lost their fucking shit. Fradker lost like, his head over where he was like I expected more from you. I think we all expected more from Holly Carnes. She was on the front cover of the Sunday Independent she, Life magazine. She, <laughs> like, should have, she should have called for a three-day period of mourning. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> With flags and flown at half mast and everything. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> definitely. Guys, thanks so much for joining us for episode three. Unfortunately, we, we'll have to apologize to Martin Callanan, former Garda commissioner. We'll have you on next week, please, God. Thanks so much and see us here back this time next week.